online family. I'm so glad to be back. Uh, this is week two for me, and I just uh, so enjoyed being able to minister uh, just the word of the Lord and minister in prayer uh, uh, with with all of you, for all of you. And I think that's a good thing to start out right now with prayer. I'm focusing um, still on, on one scripture in particular, and then I'm going to add another one, and I want us to pray together. And it's Micah chapter 2, verse 13 in the message version. I neglected to give it to our tech team, so you may or may not see it come up on the screen, but it says that it talks about how the Lord is bursting us out of our confinements, and he's bringing us into open places as we follow our king, and so now, no matter what it looks like, uh, even if it seems like we've been in this situation for a long time, we're to keep our eyes on Jesus, because he's the one who gives us freedom, whom the sun sets free is free indeed, that means total freedom in every area, in every situation, and that is what God is doing in our lives. You've got to trust this. You've got to believe it. And so, Lord, we just thank you. We look to you right now. We keep our eyes on you, knowing that you are the freedom giver and that you are raising up your church to rise and shine in this hour especially. And, Lord, we thank you for bringing us into total freedom. You are breaking confinements. You're bringing us to open places. And, Lord, we are so grateful. We can shout victory before it even happens, before it even takes place.
place because we know you. And we know that as we follow you, that, Lord, uh, sooner uh, and not later, you are bringing us out of this captivity and confinement, and we thank you. And one of the things I want to encourage you in this season is the book of James says that you have not because you ask not. And some of us, we have a, we have a tendency to look at what somebody says, their report, and think that's the end of the story. It's not the end of the story. Let's go to God and ask him for the things that we want. We want our schools to open. We want our graduations. We want uh, those of you who've lost jobs in this, in, this, uh, uh, in this season, we want jobs to be restored better than before. And so I believe that this is what God is doing and teaching us to trust him in all things, in all ways. Is there any area of your life that, that you're not trusting him? I want to encourage you to go ahead and with intent, put your trust in him and begin to ask. So, Lord, we just thank you. You said if uh, we have not because we ask not, so we ask. We ask for better than before. We ask for our schools to open. We ask for our businesses to open. We ask for our churches to open. We ask, Lord, that you would shorten the time. Lord, uh, in the Psalms, they kept saying, uh, answer us swiftly, and you responded. So, Lord, we ask for you to answer us swiftly, and we know you are responding in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So I just want to um, uh, just say a happy Mother's Day uh, to all of you who are mothers. And um, I was thinking about Leah in the book of uh Genesis chapter 29. This actually isn't my message, but I just had a couple of thoughts before I get started. But I was thinking about the situation with Leah. And one of the things that, that we noticed about Leah, because of her father, her father baited and switched, uh, you know, her husband, her husband was supposed to marry somebody else. And then it uh, turned out that uh, her father replaced her sister with her. And that was, you know, just a, a situation that just wasn't too cool. And it, and it really didn't, didn't help her at all. And so uh, one of the things that, that we read in Genesis 29 is how the Lord looked upon Leah in this situation with her marriage. And he looked at her, and he noticed that she was unloved. That's what it actually says. It says he noticed that Leah was unloved. And what did he do for her in that situation? What did God do? It says that he opened her womb because she was unloved. He opened her womb and she began to have children. He basically made her a mother. And I took note of that because being a mother is a blessing. It's a blessing. And maybe some of you feel like this is not the best day for you. There's issues in the family. You've got reasons. You're being offered up excuses that seem legitimate to lose this day and not have a good day. I want to let you know that, Mom, you are, a, you are blessed. What has happened to you, the fact that you had a child, is a blessing from God, period. No matter what's going on around you, no matter what your situation is. And I want to encourage you to just take your cues from the Lord that you are blessed. It doesn't matter what people say. It doesn't matter if everybody is, is on board with you today or not. You are blessed. He opened your womb because he said you're blessed. And, and so I want to encourage you that the Lord looks upon our situations uniquely. He looks upon our situations and he takes notice when some situations are not fair, when it's seems like um, if people are not responding to us the way we need them to or they should. He takes note of our situations and he does things for you to improve the situation. I felt like that was something uh, that needed to be heard today, that the Lord is working on your behalf to put your trust in him for this, to put your, put your trust that he's the one who gives you value. He elevates your value. He brings blessings to you, uh, you know, that only God can give to you. And I want to encourage you with that today. Now, last year this time, I also preached the Mother's Day message, and, and um, I remember what I brought last year. We're actually uh, begin with your notes right now. I hope you have your notes already. But I began to talk last year uh, this time, and I'm just going to bring a few points back to you before we, get, before we move, move on from that. But I, I brought a message to you last year about people known up. Uh, about those that I would call transitional people. And I, I would define that, okay, and I'm defining that for this teaching this morning, this, uh, this ministry this morning, as those who are first-time Christians in their family, okay, transitional people, 
first-time Christians in their families. How many of you are first-time Christians in your family? If you, if you are, just put a thumbs up in, in the chat box and let us know. I'm a first-time Christian in my family. And the Bible shows us a lot of those kind of people. You know, John the Baptist, all the early apostles, those in the early church. And so being first means that you have a transitional role. And for most, that transitional role is going to be centered on your family as you're going to be walking your family out of the old way and into the new way. You know, you're going to reclaim uh, spiritual blessings. You're going to re- you're going to uh, reclaim bloodline blessings. And because you're first, you're going to actually uh, face distinct. Uh, unique and distinct challenges. It's heightened spiritual warfare when you're having to make that kind of turn, that kind of change, because you're breaking down demonic generational strongholds so Jesus can emerge the strong man in your family. And so I believe that there is an anointing uh, for you. There is a grace on you to actually make this change and make this turn because you're going to be working on it your whole life, okay? And God gives you a grace for it because all All he needs is one. You're the one. And all he needs is you to see a whole bunch of stuff change. And I want you to know this, and this is on your notes, number one, that he gives you strength for the turnaround. He gives you strength for the turnaround. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 9. It says, like adamant stone, harder than flint, I have made your forehead. Do not be afraid of them, nor be dismayed at their looks, that they are rebellious house. You know, maybe people have called you stubborn. Maybe they called you stuck in your ways. But there is a God-ordained stubbornness. And when it comes to stuff like this, you need to go ahead and rejoice in that. Yeah, I'm stubborn. I'm stubborn for the things of God. I'm going to see my family through. And so he gives gives us strength for the turnaround. The second thing is when God sees you, he sees your entire family, both past and future. Number two, when God sees you, he sees your entire family, both past past and future. Perhaps you've read in the Bible those long lists of genealogies, okay? I don't know about you, but they bore me. I don't read them. I I usually skip over them. But it tells us something about how God feels about genealogies because he's looking looking at you, but not just you. He's looking at all of your generations past, and he's looking at all of your generations future, because that's how the Lord sees things. And so there is a I believe this is the principle behind the promise that if one member of the household is saved, then the entire household comes under a divine appointment for salvation. Number three, God puts unique gifts and callings on families. I'm just reviewing a little bit from last year when I gave this message. Number three, God puts unique gifts and callings on families. These are your God-ordained generational blessings. A lot of times we think about the generational curse, and we're fixed on breaking that curse, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. But I want to encourage you that if there is a curse, it means there was a blessing first, okay? And so we want to remember that because the Lord wants to awaken, and he wants wants to see all these blessings that he put on your bloodline uh, come to pass, and he merge. And so uh, Second Chronicles chapter, um, or excuse me, First Chronicles chapter 12 verse 32 says, of the sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, their chiefs were 200 and all their brethren were at their command. Well, what we see here is we see a family, not an individual, but a family that had wisdom and understanding, a family that had a leadership gift. Did you know that families, not just individuals, have an assignment on the earth? And that's why if you are the first one, if you are the you are the transitional one, okay, the Lord is looking at you, the individual, but he's saying your entire family has a blessing. That might be hard for you to believe because you see them day to day. But I want to encourage you, the Lord has a blessing on your family that he wants to see each emerge. Number four, transitional people are concerned with repentance. They stand in the gap. They break every curse in Jesus' name. Okay, in case you're unsure what the curse even looks like, let me tell you what it is. Here's a biblical list um, uh, about what you have been redeemed from in Christ. It no longer belongs to you. And this comes out of Galatians 3.13 and Deuteronomy 28. I just compiled it, summarized it. Here's the things that 
you have been redeemed from. Things that, that as you repent, God forgives and he heals. Okay, Second Chronicles 7.14. And these things are broken because you are in Christ. It's positional, but now we need to stand for it. Here they are. Sickness and prolonged sickness. That's a curse. It's broken in Jesus' name. Plagues. It's broken in Jesus' name. Early death helplessness, destruction, madness. You know all those crazy people in your family? Well, the Lord has broken that in Jesus' name. Confusion, blindness, poverty, being consumed, debt, drought, defeat, weakness, low position, no safety, being scattered, broken families, infertility, being unwanted. All of these things are broken in Jesus' name. And so as a transitional person, you get to start uh, seeing these things broken in your family in Jesus' name because you're redeemed from every one of these. And I think it's powerful to know that the blood of Jesus breaks all these things down and the blood of Jesus brings such a blessing upon your family that he reverses every curse and he makes it better than before. And so, you mu- so we want to answer the question and I want to encourage you today that you're prayers, uh, your prayers can change your family. A lot of times we look at the situation and yes, you're the first one to get away. You're the first one to make the change. You're the first one to make the turn. And it's like, it's tough because nobody's validating that. Nobody seems to be going with you at the moment. But I want to tell you that your prayers are what God needs because your prayers are what he works with. He needs someone on the earth to pray and invite him in. And that's you. And when you do that, there is a claim upon the whole family that begins to work, begins to act. It's supernatural. It's a mystery how it happens, but it does happen. And I, I want to just say again that all God needs is one, just one person in that wicked, evil family. He just needs one to turn to him. And there, there, is, a, a, um, there is an act of a supernatural turnaround that begins to start in the entire family. He just needs one one person who's going to pray in faith, believing God's promises is enough to turn it around. And so what is God's promise to your family? This is how we pray. We ask God, what is his specific promise to the family? Because when we're going to see a turnaround, we have to go find the promises in his word. His word is alive. His word is sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts things down. It builds things up. When Jesus went into the wilderness because he was being tempted by Satan for 40 days. He was driven into the wilderness. Satan even knew the power of the word and tried to twist the word and use it against Jesus. But what did Jesus do? He fought back with the word. You know, he took the word and struck down the lie that Satan offered him. And so this is why we want to go to God's word and find the promises that he he is speaking about our family because those words will supersede and destroy anything that Satan is speaking against your family, anything that your family is engaged in that is um, uh, hideous and evil and wicked or broken down, his word will supersede it. His word is powerful. His word is alive. It's living, and it turns dead things back uh, uh, back into life. It is a turnaround element. And so we want to ask, what what does um, what is God's uh, promise? What is he speaking over our family? Because God is speaking a promise to your family. So we can start with this, Acts 16, 31. Uh, So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your whole household. You know, I keep telling you that the whole household will be saved. That's a promise. That's a promise that you can stand on. That's a promise that you can bring to the Lord every single day, every moment of the day, as many times as you need to along the journey journey of, of turnaround, along the, the, the timeline of turnaround, and say, Lord, you said,
said that if, if, um, if I'm saved, my whole household is saved. You said, I believe your word. You're going to save my entire household. I believe you. I am standing for them. I proclaim. That's for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. And so you can take those promises to God because God speaks a promise to your family. Perhaps he's saying that he's going to restore everything that was lost because God does a work of restoration in families. What does restoration look like? Well, restoration is not just, you know, making something look, you know, just barely good enough again, to making something look just kind of functional again. When something gets restored, um, the Lord restores with an exclamation point. When something gets restored, the Lord restores it better than before. You have to believe that, that we're going to come out better, not worse, not uh, so-so, not semi. We're going to come out better than before. That's, that's the Lord's restoration. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 3, I believe it's in the message version, it says, God will restore everything that you lost. Okay, that's everything that you lost, even the things you didn't know that you lo- you lost, okay? And, and Zechariah 9, cha- uh, chapter 9, verse 12, there is a promise of double restoration. This is the generosity of the Lord. Some of us, we're just settling. We're just settling. Well, I'm glad they're saved, but they're, they're so crazy and they're so sick. No, don't settle for crazy and sick and saved. Settle for saved and sane. Settle for saved and healed because God does a work of restoration. He restores you better than before. And so as the Lord gives you promises, he gives us promises, okay? Specific promises to your family. He begins to speak and say, and say, this is a generational blessing. Call it out. This is, this is what I'm speaking about, about your lineage and your legacy. Call it out. Okay. As, as you are along that journey and you know your end point, I call these promises the end point. This is where we're going. My whole household shall be saved. He's going to restore it better than before. He's restoring it with an exclamation point. Every generational blessing is being called out. Every generational curse is being broken. It's going to be so broken we're never going to even know it was there. Okay? I look forward to that day when we don't even smell the scent of that curse ever again. And so when the Lord uh, is taking you through that journey of seeing a promise come to pass, there is there are things that we actually pray into day by day along that journey I call these the the daily bread prayers Matthew chapter 6 verse 11 Jesus taught his disciples to pray and he taught them he said you know um, uh, he, he taught them uh, you know we call it the Lord's prayers and one of the things he told them to pray is to pray give us this day our daily bread now a lot of us we look at that as provision it does mean that but also it has a another meaning. It means give us today our daily word so that we can see provision. And so the daily word is is what we actually lay hold of from the Lord day in and day out. And it leads us to breakthrough. It leads us to prosperity. It leads us to seeing our families um, shifted and changed. I feel so strongly some of you have settled for, for crazy family. Some of you have settled. You're like, I'm glad they're saved, but they're still crazy. Stop settling. Stop settling. There is a greater restoration for you. I want you to lift up your eyes and see a better promise and see a better restoration. There's something about this, okay? Uh, the Lord is saying, I've got so much better for you, but I, but he needs your faith. He's got to work with your faith, and he's got to work with, with your decrees, and he's got to work with your declarations. The Lord, he actually does, you know, he works with the faith of his church. He works with the faith with the transitional person. So go ahead and upgrade your prayers, upgrade um, what you've been believing for, upgrade what you, what you have been seeing and envisioning. The Lord will work with you on that. And so Matthew chapter six, verse 11 says, give us this day, our daily bread. And so there's going to be clusters of, of things that he will show you how to pray that day or over a series of days as you get to your end point, that your entire household's going to be saved, that there is a restoration. It can involve over a, 
a period of days, he'll say, I want, you to, I want you to take authority over that stronghold and command it destroyed in my name. He might want you to say, I want you to, I want you to declare this particular blessing over your family and just declare it, decree it over your family in my name. And he will give you these specific clusters along, along the journey of um, you know, going to that full restoration. And so as you are working through this with the Lord, you the transitional person, you the first one, you the, the, the one that is turning things around and seeing and realizing uh, all of the, the generational blessings coming to pass, the attack against, against you is going to be this. Satan is going to create strategies to try and get you to stop praying because your prayers are powerful. That's all God's, God needs is your prayer, your faith. That's all he needs to see it turn around. But what happens is Satan begins to work against that. He begins to create strategies. And I want to give you some specific things to watch out for so that you don't get caught up in it and you don't stop praying, okay? One of the things we see in the life of Hannah, Hannah was offered up a fence from many different levels. She was offered up a fence at God. She was offered up a fence at her family. Um, she was offered up a fence at the church, at the priest of the church. She was offered up a fence along her journey to see a promise come to pass. At each occasion, she made a choice. I won't be offended. I will still believe. Some of you need to take that up. Take up what Hannah did. I won't be offended. I will still believe. I will still believe for the promise of having uh, a son as the Lord has spoken to me. Then we see JL. JL was interesting because her husband actually made an agreement and an alignment with enemies of Israel. So her husband was compromising. Her husband was playing both sides. But when the enemy came in um, uh, needing hospitality, when the, uh, the, the captain of the enemy army came to her home, because it was a friendly home, came to her home uh, seeking hospitality, she gave him hospitality and then she gave him a nail in the head. And so so we want to be people that we want to know, I want you to, to assure you that even if your family is aligned with the enemy, that you can still live righteously and pray for um, a destruction of the enemy against your family, okay? And so we see with King David, we see that his spouse, Michael, she actually rejected his calling. Uh, she rejected God's calling on his life, and she did it at the worst moment, at the worst time. While he was celebrating his coronation, she was rejecting it. And so I want to I want to let you know that even if your family rejects God's calling on your life, go ahead and keep praying. Keep Keep believing. Keep, keep, you know, worshiping God. Don't let family rejection of your God calling stop you from praying. Then we see Job. Job had terrible pain, loss, and suffering. I don't know about you, but sometimes you can get bitter at God when you lose everything and you're feeling sick at the same time. But Job chose to worship God. He didn't, he didn't stop his praying, and the Lord ended up giving him double, giving, giving him double for his trouble. And so Job Job learned that even in the midst of pain, suffering, and terrible loss, that his prayers would still yield a family that God had designed for him. And then we see Joseph. Joseph had family rejection. His family rejected him. They shouldn't have. And Joseph ended up being, you know, the top dog because he still believed the Lord. And it ended up being, uh, it ended up saving his family later. Isn't that interesting that the family's rejection of him got so that became the family's turnaround, became the family's salvation in the end. So don't stop praying for your family. We see all sorts of characters. Daniel, you know, he, he um, was taken from his parents. He was enslaved to a wicked king, and yet the Lord still blessed him. The Lord, um, the, the, the Lord still, uh, you know, encouraged him. Jonah, he overcame personal disobedience, all right? He overcame personal disobedience. Hezekiah is my favorite. He 
got a bad word from the prophet. And when he got a bad word from the prophet that he was going to die, he prayed to God. And God sent that same prophet back to him and said, you're going to live now. I don't know about you, but something about that encourages me. Here's my point that, you know, and I could just keep going. I could keep going with all of them. You know, Jeremiah, you know, he, he, nobody listened to him and they all went into captivity, yet he still kept his prayer before the Lord. No matter what your situation, I brought all of these situations to you because there's always an excuse that's offered to you to stop praying. Don't take the bait. Keep praying. Keep believing. Especially if you're the transitional one. You're the only one. You're the you're the you're the one that's going to bring the turnaround. Your prayers uh, are going to bring the turnaround. Your tears of intercession are never wasted. Your tears in the middle of the night are never forgotten. Uh, you know the Lord sees every tear. The Lord sees every cry. The Lord sees every sigh, and He says that is is a, a breakthrough for that family. And he is working in the invisible realm. He is working in the, the deep places of people's hearts. He is working where you don't see that he is working. I know it can seem like, wow, you know, nobody is listening. That was Jeremiah. Nobody is listening to me. I'm telling them that hell is real. I'm telling them, you know, this is going to destroy you. I'm telling them that there's a better way. And it seems like nobody is listening. I want to show you that God has a promise for your family that somehow some way there's going to be a breakthrough that your prayers will not be forsaken your prayers will not be forgotten you could be good and dead and the kids you prayed for and seem like they never turned around God will get them after you're dead because he doesn't forget your prayers and so I want to encourage you to not stop praying for your for your family and so um, I want you to repeat after me I have a set of decrees that I make for my family, things that the Lord has spoken to me, and I've shared them with others, um, and I'm going to, you know, have you pray with me uh, a few of these, but then I'm going to declare them over you, and I'll drop it on my Facebook somewhere so you can pick them up if you don't already have them, but this there's this thing about making a decree. I talked about it briefly last week. Job chapter 22, verse 28, it says, Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon, the, upon thy ways. The Hebrew word for decree in this passage is a command that not only establishes something, but it also divides and cuts something down at the same time. I'll say that again. The Hebrew word for decree in this passage is a command that not only establishes something, but also divides and cuts something down at the same time. Uh, Job 22, 28, thou shalt also decree a thing, and it will be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thee upon my ways. So I want you to say this with me. This is a decree that we're making right from the word of God, especially you transitional people. This is very important that these are the things that come out of your mouth, especially when it looks like everybody is going the wrong way. You're celebrating Mother's Day and you're like, oh my, what are we going to do with this family? Or you're celebrating a birthday and it's almost like discouraging. I want you to know that the word of God cuts things down and it establishes things and begins to work where you don't see, okay? And so repeat after me, as for me and my house, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's say it again. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Say this with me. I love God and I keep his commandments. I love him and I keep his commandments. Therefore, the blessing of God is on my family for a thousand generations. Let's say it again. I love God and I keep his commandments. Therefore, the blessing of God is on my family for a thousand generations. Isn't that powerful? The blessing of God is on my family for a thousand generations. I could say that all day long. I can make that decree all day long. That comes out of Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 9. Uh, the blessing of God is on my family for a thousand generations. Now I'm just going to make some decrees over your family based on what, what I do for my family, but I'm going to make these decrees and I'll drop these online for you um, uh, sometime today. But I just probably 
prophesy and decree over your family that your sons and your daughters will prophesy. They will dream dreams. They will have visions from the Lord. I just decree that your family is growing in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. I decree that every generational blessing will be revealed and stewarded in your family line. No blessing, no gift, no talent or divine ability shall be lost. I decree that every member of your family in this generation and in this in the future generations will be saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, and serve the Lord wholeheartedly. I decree over the men in your family that they will serve the Lord. I decree over the women in your family they will serve the Lord. I decree over every child. A, a grandchild, great grandchild, and beyond. They will serve the Lord. I decree the Holy Spirit to be the ruling spirit of your family and the name of Jesus to be your stronghold. Now, when you have decrees like that, how can it go wrong? How can it not shift into order at some point and some time? It has to because that decree is an establishing decree. That decree cuts things down that Satan purposed against you. That decree brings the light of God upon all of your ways. And so when you begin to make these decrees, you begin to accumulate these promises, these things that you are your end points, um, these day-to-day -day journeys of prayer and declaration as you are getting to, uh, you know, the breakthrough point. How can, how can um, uh, your family escape those kind of prayers? And so don't take the excuse, you know, don't take the excuse of offense. Don't take the excuse when it looks like your entire family is aligned to the devil, when you're the only one aligned to God. Don't take the excuse and the bait when it seems like your spouse rejects the call of God in your life. Don't take the excuse and, and trust God for grace when you're in pain and suffering because the Lord gives you his grace. You're the one. He only needs one to see a turnaround in your family. Just one one and it shall be done amen and so I just want to I just want to praise the Lord that God is doing a powerful work of restoration believe it believe it believe it he's doing a work I'm going to invite my husband to come up he's going to pray he's going to pray this morning specifically all right is she on fire or what oh my goodness you want to pray for all the moms this morning we want to bless you and not just all the moms, we want to pray for all the ladies out there uh, watching. Some of you have already raised your kids. Some of you are raising them right now. Some of you um, are going to have kids. You don't have them yet. Some of you are spiritual moms. Either way, this morning we want to bless you. We want to pray over you. You know, years ago, I heard a message. Uh, this was years ago before I, I even had kids. I heard, I heard a message. I think it was Tommy Barnett comparing... Uh, the role of the mom in the home to the role of the uh, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the Trinity. I know some of you ladies like that since I said it, but you were talking about how the earth was without form and void, and the Holy Spirit brought order. You know, ladies, many of you bring such order to your house. You know, the Holy Spirit comforts. The Holy Spirit uh, brings peace. And moms, that's what you do. Ladies, what you, that's what you do in the house. Bring peace, bring comfort, bring order many times. So this morning we want to bless you. We want to pray God's favor, God's grace upon your life. You know, many times as, uh, you know, especially as kids growing up, we think mom is a superhero because it seems like she could do anything. But yet we know that you need the grace of God upon your life to fulfill the call of God that's upon your life. So. We just pray for you this morning. Father, I pray for every mom. I pray for all the ladies, whether it's a, she's physically a mom, a spiritually a mom. We thank you, Lord, that uh, for your grace upon them. Lord, we thank you for the uniqueness of their role, just like the Holy Spirit that brought order, that brought peace, that brought uh, comfort. We thank you, Lord, that's what our moms do. That's what mothers do. And God, we just thank you for them. But yet we ask for your grace to come upon them the grace of God to to fulfill the call of God upon their life the unique call Lord the unique call that's upon their kids upon their family that there be an anointing upon the moms to bring that out and Lord we just thank you for them we just stand today as a church and call them blessed we call the women of the ladies of Harvest Church blessed today 
and we just thank you for them in the name of Jesus. And I want to speak to you this morning. Maybe you're watching this morning online and uh, you've never given your life to Jesus. Or maybe at one time you have, but right, right now you're not right with God. You're not serving Him. You know, uh, there's no such thing as a label of Christianity. You're either in the kingdom or you're not. You're either on fire for God or you're not. So this morning I want to invite you. Maybe you're saying, Pastor, I, th I think I'm saved, but I'm just lukewarm. You know, it's a good time for you to catch fire again. It's a good time for you to recommit your life to God. So if you're with me this morning, if you're out there watching and, and you haven't made this commitment to the Lord, if you died tonight, you don't know you're going to go to heaven. I want you to pray this with me. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. And I make you the Lord of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Say this. I renounce every spirit but the Holy Spirit. And according to your word, I am now born again. If you pray that prayer this morning, the Bible says the angels in heaven are rejoicing right now because of that one decision that you made, that just you made right now. The angels are rejoicing. And listen, and we want to rejoice with you too. So we want you to let us know. Uh, if you're watching on the online campus, I, I believe there's a button on there that says, I raised my hand. Uh, you physically didn't, might have not raised your hand, but I know you did in your heart. So I want you to press that button and just uh, fill that, the information there and let us know which, the prayer that you prayed. Maybe you're watching this online on Facebook right now, or maybe you're watching a replay and you pray this prayer. Right now, just send us an email. All you have to do is just let us know you pray that prayer. You send an email to info at harvestonline.church. Info at harvestonline.church. And just let us know you pray that prayer. We want to rejoice with you. We want to be able to support you and give you some information and, and uh, help you grow in your new relationship with Jesus. Come on, I want to invite you, remind you again, don't forget our drive through uh, from 1 to 2 p.m., this afternoon at the downtown campus Turlock Ministry Center. We just want to uh, bless you, wave at all the moms, say hello, give you a gift, and it's going to be a wonderful time. Come on, let's end the service together in worship this morning.